When did modern philosophy start? In the 17th century, with René Descartes, which, compared to music or fashion or art, may not exactly sound modern to you, but philosophy takes a longer-term view. Medieval Europe has a lousy reputation for intellectual, scientific, cultural stagnation. The years 400 to 1400 low on inspiration, and many point the finger at the church's domination, placing too much faith in the Bible's crusty pages, so any kind of progress came in very tiny stages. They built some nice cathedrals, though, so that debate still rages, but there's good reason why this time was christened the Dark Ages. Then, Luther and the Reformation cast a ray of light. If two rival churches spoke for God, how could both be right? The printing press of Gutenberg was helping spread ideas, like Copernicus's revolutions of the heavenly spheres, which showed the earth is not the centre of God's universe, and a bitter blow for Bible fans proved something even worse. Nor are we. With new worlds across the Atlantic and round beyond the Cape, and an energetic, bold approach to science taking shape, the age of stifling darkness was drawing to a close, and human thought was stirring from its thousand-year-long doze. In the midst of this thrilling renaissance, this newly enlightened dawn, in midwestern France, a pale, sickly child with a nasty cough was born. He was sent to a Jesuit college, where the rector gave René permission to sleep late and skip morning lessons due to his frail condition. This was a habit he kept as an adult, happy to stay in bed, eyes closed in contemplation of the thoughts that locked horns in his head. And when the young student turned up for class, refreshed from his pre-lunch slumbers, he developed an interest in physics and a lifelong passion for numbers. If being a big-name philosopher isn't impressive enough, what Descartes brought to mathematics includes some remarkable stuff, like inventing the graph with Cartesian coordinates, plotting points on an X and Y axis, lines which today zigzag life's ups and downs from political polling to taxes. And although creative ideas are notoriously tricky to own, he's credited with suggesting X to indicate an unknown. Once he was done with his school books, he gained a degree in law, but keen to explore the great book of the world, he signed up to go to war. Young René saw no combat, but he witnessed among his peers struggles for certainty, contradictions, battles of ideas. Life, he could see, is as open to question as anything in books, with even the simplest seeming of truth, not as simple as it looks. A snappy dresser, sword by his side, his hair now fashionably curled, Descartes felt ready to put down in words his personal view of the world. He settled in free-thinking Holland, the wisest choice to make, a country where writers could say what they thought without being burned at the stake. But even though the Netherlands tried to protect free speech, it was still as well to be wary of the Inquisition's reach. Descartes had just completed a book which accepted from page one that Copernicus was right, the earth revolved around the sun, when all of a sudden the audacious author found his resolve being tested. As word began to spread, Galileo's been arrested for pulling the rug from under the Pope by daring to push the envelope and confirming through his telescope what Copernicus had suggested. So Descartes, in the hope that he'd continue unmolested and avoid the inconvenience of an angry Pope's damnation, decided that, on second thoughts, he'd cancel publication. Descartes' world, Le Monde, finally saw the light of day, but more than ten years after he'd safely passed away. The works René Descartes went on to write turned the whole world on its head, so the church may have wished, in hindsight, that he'd published Le Monde instead. In his Discourse on the Method, and then his Meditations, Descartes' two main works share the same key revelations. 
his love of maths and physics had made him well disposed to the fresh approach to science Francis Bacon had proposed. An open, honest pooling of facts, no mystical delusions, no appeals to belief, simply shared observations, building to general conclusions. But a world on the cusp of enlightenment could not afford to relax, as an unexpected opponent could now stop it all dead in its tracks. This looming shadow was not the church, but unless a solution was found, the scientific revolution might never get off the ground. While religion was starting to fracture, a new faith had come centre stage. To view the world with scepticism was suddenly all the rage. When you challenge long-standing authorities, a questioning spirit's essential to treat tradition with open suspicion, be stubborn, and not deferential. So scepticism's a vital tool for progressive minds to hold. And yet, how do you know are words you can throw at the new as well as the old? Absolutely nothing is certain. The skeptic's declaration that everything in the universe was beyond all verification was, in its simple reasoned way, a threat to civilization as it carried with it an air of distrust, the foot-dragging implication that any and every advance in science was based on a flimsy foundation. This was the great conundrum that Descartes vowed to crack, to cut the chains of scepticism, holding progress back. For science to have any future, it had to be founded on truth, which must, above all, be held with certainty, utterly sceptic proof. Is there anything we can be certain of? Descartes started from scratch, determined to doubt every thought in his head in a way that no sceptic could match. A daring, imaginative project from the moment that Descartes began it, as he took on a new persona, the most sceptical man on the planet. A barrel of apples was the metaphor René Descartes used, where some of your apples will be perfect, others rotten or bruised, and if only keeping the perfect ones is your overriding concern, you should empty the barrel completely, then inspect each apple in turn. So Descartes resolved to empty his mind of every belief that he held, and if on inspection they showed imperfection, they would, apple-like, be expelled. Alone in the gloom of a dimly lit room, an unlikely superhero, Descartes set out with his method of doubt, not from square one, but square zero. Nothing, all content removed from his mind. Senseless, in darkness, how could he find a way to restore all he thought that he knew, and this time be sure Beyond doubt, it was true. In a three-stage process of self-examination, first he asked, can I really trust my powers of observation? And concluded from occasions when the senses do mislead that the truth of our perceptions cannot be guaranteed. A church spire, glowing gold and dazzling on a sunny day, may turn out when the sun's gone down to be a stony grey, and in clear water in a stream, the straight branch of a tree will look like it's bent at an angle. No, we can't believe all we see. Still playing the ultimate sceptic with the ultimate sceptic's mind, he established a second reason why certainty's so hard to find. How often, he asks, am I so convinced that things are just as they seem? When I'm living my life and I'm wide awake, then wake up and find it a dream. How do I know I'm not asleep now, naked, in bed, lying down, dreaming I'm here sitting up by the fire in my winter dressing gown? Whatever I'm thinking, whatever I feel, there's no guarantee this experience is real. Though his mind now seemed clear of assumptions, he pushed to a final third level. Is it possible all of my thoughts are controlled by some wicked, invisible devil? A powerful demon with just one aim, 
to fill Descartes' head with confusion. A misleading cheat, skilled in deceit, turning life into one long illusion. That was as deep as Descartes would dig into the black hole of doubt. He couldn't believe such a demon existed, yet nor could he quite rule it out. So, supposing some demon was now fooling him, the question for Descartes to face was, can I know anything with total certainty, even in this extreme case? Just one certainty was all that he sought. So he thought, and he thought, and he thought, and he thought. And then, in a flash, he sprang back to life, out of the darkness, a light. The demon may be deceiving me into dreaming its day when it's night. I may be forever mistaken, and yet, whatever I think, wrong or right, even wrong thinking is thinking. Wrong thoughts may be wrong, they're still thoughts. Whatever I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Doubting, conceiving, denying, perceiving. I thinking, am thinking, a thinking being. A thinking existence of sorts. And so Descartes gave to philosophy its most famous epigram. In Latin, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore... I am. Self-contained, fully reasoned, watertight, intact, irrefutable, indisputable, one certain sceptic-proof fact. Descartes, by the fire, in his dressing gown alone, had excavated the grounds for science and laid a foundation stone. With the pillars of knowledge now based on this rock, what new revelations would follow? Unhappily, Descartes' next building block for many was harder to swallow. I'm thinking, but still may be thinking things wrong. Where else can this search for truth go? To see off more doubt, be more certain about this world that I think that I know. Descartes' solution is where one might say his sceptical processes leave him. His answer is God, and he's a good God who would never want to deceive him. God is no evil demon. God would never mislead. Provided that Descartes thinks with rigour, God wants him to succeed. If Descartes' conclusions are clear and distinct and thoroughly thought through, they, like his senses and sense of the world, will, God willing, be true. The proof of God's existence, Descartes was sure it's because while he, Descartes, was finite and flawed, thinking, therefore he was, he had this idea in his imperfect mind of a totally perfect being, infinite, omnipotent, all-knowing and all-seeing. And how could such perfection take root in the human imagination? Only one way. God planted it there, his own signature on his creation. Descartes was a man of his time, a Catholic who believed, whose dependence on God should not undermine the breakthrough that he achieved. His method of doubt inspired a scrupulous, disciplined kind of research, while involving God helped make the new science acceptable to the church. To say, in a way, science demonstrated the laws of nature that God created. As well as confirming that he was alive, Descartes' cogito brought another momentous mind-bending change to the whole of Western thought. A shift in perspective for human existence, almost arrived at by stealth. No longer was God at the absolute centre. The centre was now the self. This primacy of the conscious self carved out a new divide, a canyon-like schism between mind and matter, thought and the world outside. The self that had meant mind and body was radically redefined, the body now separate, a working machine, observed from inside by our mind. This split Cartesian dualism, 
is still a predominant view, the mind and body dichotomy which makes every one of us two. The scientific revolution took this fresh outlook to heart with other great minds eager to follow the example of Descartes. He'd seen off the sceptic's resistance and shown if your method is sound, with openness and due diligence, some certainty can be found. With facts and theories tested to extremes as a matter of course, we could build a solid system of science using doubt as a positive force. Now backed by Cartesian dualism, each discovery, each invention, was an act of immaterial mind or material extension. Extension can always be measured, so mathematics can be applied, and conclusions arrived at with confidence, objectively verified. Descartes' mechanical view of the world and nature as matter in motion sparked very odd gossip about a machine which he treated with love and devotion. He'd had an affair with a serving maid, which led to a daughter, Francine. When she died of scarlet fever, aged five, it's said that he kept her memory alive by recreating her in life-size as a metal figurine. If you Google the name of Descartes, then type daughter into the mix, it's quite a surprise to find robot is the next word that Google predicts. They say he used to talk to it, but it's only fair to point out that, fittingly for a Descartes rumour, there's plenty of room for doubt. When Descartes was 53 years old, his mind was as sharp as ever, but his body sadly gave up the ghost. The reason? Freezing cold weather. By now he'd become a celebrity, a philosopher in demand, and gone to stay in Sweden at Queen Christina's royal command. She wanted philosophy lessons, though she'd failed to give him due warning that, thanks to her busy schedule, they'd be starting at five in the morning. A shock to the system, particularly for a man who was fond of a lion, which combined with the bitterest winter in years, were conditions he couldn't get by in. He died of pneumonia, was buried in Stockholm. Then, after a 16-year lull, his body was moved from Sweden to France, complete, except for his skull. Some say it's now in the Musée de l'Homme, one of Paris's finest collections. Others believe the skull was blasted, broken up to be sold on in sections. On this somewhat macabre subject, it's probably best not to linger. Just one more thing. Stockholm's French ambassador got Descartes' index finger. Descartes and his cogito are where rationalism commences, putting trust in our powers of reasoning above our fallible senses. A philosopher with a catchphrase is quite an unusual thing, but I think therefore I am has, without doubt, a certain ring. An affirmation of existence, yet the creation of a divide between mind and matter, observer observed, the self and the world outside, raising questions about our surroundings and all that a human believes, inspiring countless philosophers and the matrix with Keanu Reeves. In a world where lives can be lived online, it's as vital as ever before to take a proactive approach to the truth, to ask, how can I be sure? With his vivid autobiographical style, his willingness to go the extra mile, it was Descartes who took the imaginative leap to show how far we must go, to be certain of any certainties, to know how we know what we know.